International Trade. Thank you very much. It's an honour to speak in the House today in support of Bill C-65, and especially because parliamentarians in the House of Common, Commons are finding common cause in taking action on workplace harassment and violence. Clearly, this affects us all. We all know someone who's experienced some form of harassment or sexual violence in the workplace, and some of us may even have experienced it ourselves. We know of the debilitating impact harassment and sexual violence has on women, on underrepresented groups, employers, and Canadians in general. This is certainly a key commitment of our government, and I'm very proud that Bill C-65 is our effort to address harassment and sexual violence in federally regulated workplaces. This bill will work to create safer and more respectful workplaces and sends a clear message to all Canadians that our government that the Government of Canada is saying harassment and sexual violence is unacceptable. Madam Speaker, there's a lot of research showing us that this workplace behaviour has certainly gone on for far too long and also has gone largely unreported. An abacus data survey last fall asked Canadians about harassment in the workplace. It found that over one in ten Canadians says sexual harassment is really quite common in their workplace. Another 44 per cent say it's infrequent, but it does happen. These respondents reported that women aged 30 to 44 are most likely to see this problem in the workplace. One-fifth say it's common, and a total of two-thirds say it happens in their workplace. The study results explain that, quote, the prevalence of this behaviour is no doubt in part because it rarely carries consequences for the harasser. The large majority of women and most men agree that normally there are no sanctions applied against those who sexually harass women in the workplace. Madam Speaker, these findings paint a staggering portrait consistent with the picture that was painted during our recent government consultations. Our government makes policy and legislative changes based on evidence through meaningful consultation with Canadians. Over the past year, the government has consulted widely with stakeholders and Canadians to gain a deeper understanding of the issue and to, de to determine the best way to move forward. Consultations were also head held with the government House Leader, members of Parliament and the Senate. And I think it's very safe to say that all members and Senators support the work that we are doing together on this front. In November of last year, we released the report, Harassment and Sexual Violence Consultations, What We Have Heard, which summarizes our consultations. I would encourage my honourable colleagues to read it and to share this with their constituents and to help educate everyone about the intolerable impact this has and join together in taking action. Allowing this type of behaviour to continue in our workplaces negatively impacts not just individuals, not just groups, but ultimately the entire country as a whole and the country's economy. For example, we know that harassment and sexual violence primarily affects women. This means that women and other vulnerable groups face barriers to fully participating in the workforce and in society. How can they not when you feel threatened at the place you work? These behaviours act as barriers to not only women, but other vulnerable and underrepresented groups, such as members of the LGBTQ2 community. Madam Speaker, these are the very groups of people that we need to ensure have a fair chance at success. We need diverse viewpoints in businesses, in organizations, in the public service, and of course, right here. Mr. Speaker, we know that our culture is largely patriarchal. Madam Speaker, I apologize. <laughs> it's a culture where the sexualization of women can contribute to intolerance. Somehow, this is seen as normal. Research shows us that visible minorities, people with disabilities, and members of the LGBTQ2 community are also disproportionately affected. What we found is that this behaviour is tied to power and privilege, and that is independent of gender. It's often those with the least power and, the, are, the, and the, are the least able to advocate for themselves. They fear reprisal, including sanctions or shame, and are the least likely also to be aware of what they can do to stop inappropriate behaviour. This creates and perpetuates inequality. Sexual harassment can be more persistent in low-wage, low-profile jobs where there is, most unfortunately, low accountability for the employer. So it means that the less power and status you have, the more likely you are to be vulnerable to experiencing harassment or sexual violence at work. The fact is 
that no one should feel scared or like a target in their place of work or anywhere else for that matter. This is especially true for women and underrepresented groups, and their families suffer as a result. Harassment and sexual violence are also critical barriers women face when entering the workforce and maintaining employment that's lucrative enough to provide for themselves and their families, which makes sexual violence and harassment not just a moral issue, but of course, an economic issue as well. Madam Speaker, victims of harassment and sexual violence often feel that once reported to their employers, any steps taken by employers to address the behavior is often insufficient or ineffective. One of the aspects of this bill would ensure that employers are required to investigate, record, and report occurrences of harassment and violence. Employers would also be required to take steps to prevent and protect against these behaviors, as well as respond to them when they do occur, and provide support to employees affected by them. Employers are not immune to paying a price and feeling a negative impact as well. This impact is felt through reputational costs, loss of productivity or absenteeism, low levels of employee commitment, high turnover, or legal costs. This adds up to lost time, stress, depression, and anxiety. It costs employers financially, and it certainly doesn't build a strong, cohesive, and resilient Canadian society. Allow me to note that we're also strengthening compliance and enforcement mechanisms under the Code. The use of monetary penalties and the authority to publicly name violators are just some of the changes announced to increase workplace health and safety and protect workers' rights. Madam Speaker, our government ran on a commitment to take action on workplace harassment and sexual violence in Parliament and in federally regulated workplaces. Today, together, we take an important step toward that aim. I'm confident we will be joined by our colleagues and Canadians and others will follow our lead. This is about what is doing right for people and for what is doing right economically. My honourable colleagues, we know the status quo is not an option. We know we need this legislation and that we should support it for families, employers and all Canadians. Thank you very much.